Hey, all right, so glad to see you guys here today, number 17. Is that how long you've been on the road? Yeah, no, I've just only been on the road for three months. So. <laughs> Summer's always a busy time for the caper team, for sure. Hey, so um, today we're going to have a whole lot of fun. Um, I'm going to lecture to you for about 56 minutes and then give you four minutes to work in collaborative group. <laughs> So actually that's not true. I'm going to talk to you for about 10 minutes, give you a little bit of structure. And then what I'm going to do is group you into groups and have you work on uh, something. A particular thing I'd like you to do is to walk away here with the structure of a nearly ready to go lecture tutorial you can use in your classroom uh, on a topic that you think is really important that needs to be done. That's our in product today. You should walk out here with a piece of paper that's almost maybe another half hour worth of work ready for you to try in your classroom. So that's our product for today. Um, so, I've got a whole team of people working with me today. Um, sitting over here is one of our PhD students, it's Dan Lyons, many of you have met. Also, next to another PhD student, Trent Minkowski, who's here. In the back, we have Stephanie Slater, and I'm Tim Slater, for those of you that haven't had a chance to meet me yet. Um, and we're part of the Center for Astronomy and Physics Education Research. We've been a center in various forms for about the last 15 years, working on a variety of issues related to how do we do a better job of teaching Astro 101. Um, please feel free to find us online, at, at, uh, on Twitter, uh, on our website, or email, at the same time you have questions. So, this issue about lecture tutorials, I'm going to spend a lot of time belaboring what we know about lecture tutorials, in that we know that they work, we know that they work really, really well, we know that how you implement them doesn't impact um, your success with them too terribly much. Of course, you can screw them up really bad, and you can do a fantastic job, but in the two standard deviations around the mean, um, they're pretty hard to, to mess up. Um, so they're based on this idea of what we now know about how people learn. In the last 10 years, what we've learned from the field of cognitive science has been incredibly useful in helping us build um, new strategies for improving teaching of Astro 101. And the three ideas that are in how people learn, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, um, I recommend you go to National Academy Press. It's online for free. It's a fantastic read. Um, the three main ideas are when your students come into your classroom, they already know a lot about the world. They know why it's hotter in the summertime. They know why leaves change color in the fall. They know why it tends to rain in some months and not in other months. Now, the problem is what they already know is often scientifically slightly inaccurate sometimes. But what we realize now is that what students think matters. And those things are well poised to interfere with what it is that you're trying to do. So we have to recognize that. The second issue is that students, are, when they take an astronomy course, they're learning a lot of new stuff. Um, in a recent textbook I spent a lot of time looking at, there were almost 800 bold-faced words in the book. Uh, that's more vocabulary that's in an introductory French course. So there's a lot of things for students to learn. So that we need, as, t as experts in the field, it's our job not to tell them stuff, but our job to build structures to allow them to hang their ideas, their new things that they're learning on in a way that makes sense. And the third thing, something we all, often don't realize when we're teaching college-level students, is 18-year-old kids are still learning how to learn. And so part of our job is to help them engage with what we call metacognition, this idea of thinking about thinking. In other words, we're trying to help students realize when they've learned something and when they don't understand something. So these are the three big ideas of how people learn. And the Lex Tutorials Project that was initiated almost 13 years ago uh, by Jeff Adams and myself um, took the, tried to take these ideas and figure out how do we implement them in a lecture classroom. We were teaching classes of about 600 students at a time in those days. So the brief history of these things called lecture tutorials, which if you're not familiar with them, this is going to make absolutely no sense whatsoever. But as I look around the room, many of your faces are familiar, so I think many of you have seen these things before. Um, the brief history of this is that about 20 years ago, there was a group in the physics department at the University of Washington. They were looking at, at engineering physics courses, the calculus-based physics courses, and saying, our students just aren't learning what we want them to learn. And so what they started doing was creating what they called recitation sections or discussion sections in addition to lecture, where they had students interact with really hard ideas in calculus-based physics, and they did so using a strategy called Socratic Dialogue, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. And they've had incredible success over the last um, uh, 20 years with this. So when we started looking at introductory astronomy, a faculty, and we started talking to them and saying, you know, sometimes your students aren't learning as much as you'd like them to learn, many faculty bought into the idea pretty quickly. Well, maybe me standing at the front of the room Cleverly giving you great examples and illustrations may not be the best way for my students to learn. But then faculty said, okay, well, what is the best way for students to learn if lecturing isn't it? 
and we were looking at each other in about 1996 saying, well, lecture isn't very good. What, what is? Lecture isn't very good. We didn't have people, anything to hand people. So um, Jeff Adams and I, we were at Montana State University, put together a book which is still running around this conference somewhere called Learner-Centered Approach to Teaching, in which we outlined a lot of the ideas of what cognitive science was telling us about what good teaching looked like. And it was a fantastic book at the time. It's a bit dated now um, because there's a lot more that we understand. But what that led us to is people wanted really good examples. So that led us to an NSF-funded project called the Lecture Tutorials for Introductory Astronomy Project. It was funded in 1999. And we started trying to figure out, well, if I had a student come to my office and sit down with me, and I had just 10 minutes to chat with them, what is it I would do during that 10 minutes with them, one-on-one? -on -one? What would I ask them about? How would I lead them through the thinking process of a variety of different ideas? And so we wrote a series of these things, and we tried them out in our classes, and it was a complete and total flop. It was a disaster. We could not make it work very well. So we kept working on it, kept working on it. We added a few people to our team. Um, one was a young postdoc by the name of Ed Prather, who was at the University of Miami at the time. Um, and as we started trying these things out with students and sitting down with students and working through them, we began to realize that there was a certain formula for building these things that worked really well that didn't work other times. No, so you might say, well, what was that all about? Well, the first thing was, when you first look at these lecture tutorials, what people often say is, oh, these are way too easy. My students wouldn't have any problem with these. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that's the key. Things that are deceptively easy to faculty often aren't easy with other students. And so as we started sharing this with these faculty, what we realized, we couldn't just hand them to people and say, hey, go do this, it'll help. Faculty actually had to try them out and actually be a student and have that aha moment Things. And that was the key to lecture tutorials becoming as successful as they are. So faculty decided not just to look at them, but actually try them. So what's the point of a lecture tutorial? Well, the whole point was, how do we help faculty who are busy doing lots of things, teaching lots of classes, doing research, managing things in the community, how do we help them? How do we help them get out of lecture mode? And so what we did is we created these, so created these things called Socratic Dialogues. Um, to help, help faculty working in large classes have these one-on-one -on -one discussions with their students, but not actually have to be there in front of their students, but actually use a piece of paper to mediate that discussion so they can intellectually idea, you know, engage in these ideas. And we decided there were some topics that students needed help with and some topics they didn't. For example, we didn't need to intellectually engage students in this idea that there are nine planets in the solar, that there are eight planets in the, <laughs> that there are some planets in the solar system. <laughs> But there are some things students really do, do struggle with. And so what we focused on were very short engagements, that 10-minute discussion you'd have with your student in, in your office where they would have an aha moment. They'd have that light bulb go on over a very narrow topic. Um, not absolutely everything, not the entire Big Bang, but very narrow topics. And so we used this approach called the Socratic Dialogue. And what so Socrates believed about teaching was, was very strongly rooted in this idea that the human brain is the most amazing thing. And students or learners probably already know the answer. What your job is, is to ask them a carefully sequenced set of questions that help them realize what the correct answer is. That was the Socratic dialogue approach. Now, is that correct? Probably not. If we start to look at deep cognitive science and deep things that help people learn, that's not a, students don't all, actually already know everything about the big thing, and you just have to ask them the right questions. But it's a nice proxy, a nice way to think about, about how do I interact with students, how do I ask them a series of questions that gets them to where I want them to be. And that's what we call Socratic Dialogue. And the lecture tutorials are all based on what are the 10 questions I would ask my students to get them to an idea so that they understand. All right. So what I want you to do is to imagine for a minute the two students come into your office. The reason you want two students is because you want them to talk to each other a little bit. Imagine two students come into your office and they say, you know, I really don't understand this thing you were talking about in class today. In particular, could you explain again this idea about, come on, you already know what that idea is. You've had that student walk into your class, into your office. For everyone in you, it's going to be slightly different. So what do you do? Well, one thing is you could stand up and give your lecture again. You could turn around your laptop and show them the PowerPoint slides again. You could do that. Or you could engage the students in a conversation, a series of questions to find out what they understand and what they don't, and lead them to the idea. So the first thing 
that we often do is ask students about something familiar. So for example, we're talking about, about the issues related to distance and, and, and luminosity and brightness. You might start to ask students about, and I'm going to leave this up here, so don't feel like you madly have to copy these down. This is going to stay up there, stay out. Um, you might ask them about something seemingly unrelated. Like, for example, what, you ever been outside and watched cars coming over the horizon? Um, and ask them some questions about that. And they say, okay, well, let's talk about astronomy here for a minute. And so what you would probably do in this office hour that you're having, this office 10 minutes, if you will, is you ask them some simple questions that you're pretty sure they can get the answer correct to. And the reason you want to do that is so that they have some early success, that they don't immediately say, well, I clearly can't understand it. And then you might say, OK, here's my key question. I know that the student's probably struggling with this common idea, because students have been struggling with this for 30 years. Or at least I've known about it for 30 years, probably longer than that. You might ask them a question, try to bait them a little bit. Encourage them to say the wrong answer, if you will. Intentionally elicit an idea. Well, then you, what we often do is we use something called a student debate, where we say, okay, well, imagine two students are talking to one another. Student one says this, student two says this, and I've done a bunch of examples here that I'm going to hand out in just a moment, in which we give students the language to describe these things. And often students understand something, but they don't have the right words to describe it. Or they don't understand something, but they know all the right words, and they put it together in a way that makes you think that they understand it. So we put them in these little debates, which is particularly going after this this complex idea or this misconception. And then after students have engaged with that, finally, we spiral back to say, OK, if you understand this idea, does that change the way you thought about question five before? Or <laughs> look at a novel application. Well, if this is true, imagine we're talking about galaxies that are very far away. How might that apply in this case? That's the structure that we use. It takes about 10 minutes. Ideally, to go through these things. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. Often they're too long. But the original idea was to keep these things relatively short. And pick a very, very narrow topic. For example, the relationship between light and distance. Or the uh, how you figure out spectroscopic parallax. Not the entire HR diagram. Or the entire evolutionary sequence of stars. But something very narrow, narrow that takes about 10 minutes. And they're designed to be used not to teach students something, but actually they're designed to be used post-instruction. So you've lectured about it. Now I want students to engage in this idea. We don't use lecture tutorials to teach. We use lecture tutorials to have students exercise and play around with an idea. All right, so what? Now I want to have you guys give it a shot. So what I want you to walk out of here with is a piece of paper where you scribble down what the sequence might look like for a particular idea that you're working on. I want you to work with somebody else because it turns out when you talk to someone else and you put these ideas together, that the process of talking it out makes you, helps you think about these things. Now before you think that these lecture tutorials here uh, by Prather, Slater, Adams, Brissenden, and others is the only, is the sacrosanct, perfect set of tutorials, I'm here to tell you, they ain't. They're the best we could do with our limited brain power and the amount of Budweiser we could afford at the time. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. See, it was a nerve. Um, these are pretty good because we've used these with thousands of students and gone back and sat with them and listened to them and tweaked them a little bit. So I'm pretty happy with these. They don't cover absolutely everything. Um, and again, it's the idea that's important here. Jessica Smay sitting in the back of the room who, did, who went to one of our workshops and said, you know what, we should do this for my geology class. And she's published a bunch of these for geology. So if any of you teach earth science as well, they exist in earth science. Um, I think you guys can do this. In fact, I know you guys can do this. And there are some topics that you'd like to, to focus on. So here's what I'd like to do. Um, let's go into general categories that people can split up a little bit. So think for just 15 seconds about something you'd like to work on. That's a lot of pressure right now. Default to galaxies, man. <laughs> no. You should try something totally different, man. Because no. you're going to learn a lot by talking to other people and talking it out. That the magic here is not in your brain. The magic here is when somebody else looks at what you're working on and says, well, that's dumb. I think students do it this way. You don't have to agree with them, but say, oh, well, yeah, maybe. Right? The magic here is in the people. All right, so. 
Let's do, some th let's do three broad categories, and then we can subdivide from there. If you're interested in celestial sphere, nighttime sky, a telescope observing type stuff, I want to have you group on this third of the room. If you're interested in solar system planet type stuff, maybe geology of the Earth, maybe uh, geology of Mars, I'm going to have you work in this. That's not the third, right? <laughs> Damn. Oh, <laughs> this fourth of the room. If you're interested in stars, stellar evolution type stuff, I'm going to have you work in this quarter of the room. And if you're interested in galaxies, large-scale structure sorts of issues, I'm going to have you work in this quarter of the room. And Dan, Trent, I, and Stephanie will each take, take a quarter of you.